send in the worst sinners that there ever was in the world, I believe God can save them. Don't you? He saved you, did he not? Amen. Let's see. I guess I ought to turn to Exodus 20. Exodus 20, 70th chapter of the Bible. I mentioned that last week. I think God put it in the exact right place in the Bible. The first words of Exodus 20, there's seven of them. And God spake all these words saying, and I suppose that because of verse 1 is the reason why in our time we have seen every schoolhouse Every jailhouse, every courthouse, every public house, every city park, every place you can imagine, including a few churches, take out whatever copy they had of the Ten Commandments. You know, it's emblazoned in the door of the Supreme Court of the United States of America on the door is an emblem of the Ten Commandments. When you walk in that door, there's an emblem of the Ten Commandments on that door. But I guess because they can't change those doors that they haven't taken those down yet. But I guess because God apparently said these words that man doesn't want anything to do with them. And I'm going to be honest with you. As I've always tried to be, my flesh does not like these laws. My flesh rebels against these laws. My flesh wants to do the opposite of what God says here. And in many cases, my flesh has already violated these laws. Now, these laws, as with any law... A law cannot be a law unless there is someone to enforce the law. Say amen to that. You know what that means, don't you? That somebody using a sword, a spear, or a gun, putting it up to somebody and saying, you're under arrest. We are charging you and we are taking away your rights to freedom until we have had a trial, until we have either found you innocent or found you guilty of breaking these laws. And if we find you guilty of breaking these laws, there is going to be a punishment for breaking these laws. And I want to ask you a question this morning. It may be something you know, maybe something you've already thought of, or maybe something you've never thought of before. If you've ever really studied the Old Testament and studied the laws that God gave to Moses, we have the Ten Commandments here, and then we have the civil and religious laws that God gave to the Israel as a nation so that they could govern themselves. Men have to be governed. Say amen to that. There's no such thing as a man who does not need to be governed. Even the constitution that we have with the freedoms that, that it gives us, the founders wrote in their early documents and said, this constitution only works for a people who have somewhat of an ability to govern themselves. But if they can't govern themselves, then this form of government will not work because men need to be governed. And I want to, I want to ask you the question this morning before I start is... In all of the laws that God gave to the children of Israel in the wilderness, did God ever Im impose a law or a statute that required Israel to build a penitentiary, a jail, a prison, a pokey, or whatever you want to call it? Was there ever a jail built, ordered and ordained by God in the Mosaic law, was there ever a jail or a prison built? 
No. In none of the laws that God gave Israel while they were wandering in the wilderness, there was, there was no prison, penitentiary, what do they call them? Um, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Not huskal. Correctional facilities. Let me ask the question. Do most correctional facilities actually correct anybody? No. You see, because what God had written in the law was was that when, when anybody was found breaking any of these laws, they were brought immediately to a judge. The judge then would either that day or the next day hold a trial with the witnesses, determine whether or not the person was actually guilty of breaking the law at the mouth of two or three witnesses. And if they were found guilty then, sentence was to be carried out immediately. Either the lash or financial restitution or a fine penalty was given or if it was serious enough the death penalty but there was no such thing as a correctional facility in God's law to the Israelites and what I'm saying to you is those of us who have been guilty of breaking God's law, it is by God's grace that you have not received your judgment yet. Somebody say amen. I mean, how long did God let you walk in sin? Putting up with you, tolerating you, writing your sins down. How long did God let you walk in sin until the day that he finally saw fit to save you and to wash your sins away and to forgive you. Was it when you were young, when you were 8, 9, 10, 11 years old? Were you 20 years old, 30 years old, 50 years old, 60 years old? I remember Buster Montgomery, bless his heart, World War II veteran. I love that man. He loved this church. He fell in love with this church first time he came. His wife came because she was a good Christian woman, wanted a church to go to. This was the closest one to their house. She, they came here, and, and once they came here, they never went anywhere else. But I remember the day that he came, and he had been going here for, I don't know, a couple years. He had dealt with cancer. That's why they moved to this area to begin with. And oftentimes when I would ask for testimonies, old Buster would stand up. And boy, he just couldn't hold the tears in. He'd just say, I just want everybody to know I love this church. It's the best church I've ever been to. You're all the friendliest people in the world. I love this church. And I just, boy, I, I thank God for moving my wife and I here. And I thank God for this church. Didn't I didn't know where the man stood with God. He got a hold of me one day after church. And he said, Mike, he said, can you come by the house one day? I want to talk to you. I'm going to pour you some iced tea and we'll talk. I said, you got me. Let's go. So I came up, went over to his church house that Saturday. And he used to be a, a, a submarine man in the Pacific in World War II. And I liked submarines and I liked ships. And so we talked about that a little bit. And I finally said, Buster, what did you have me over here to talk about? And he said, I wanted to know how is it that a man knows he, he goes, he's going to heaven or not. Now, I didn't do that to that man. I never asked that man one question about, are you saved? Are you going to heaven? God laid it on his heart. He was probably 78, 79, maybe 80 years old by then, or 77, I think. Is how old he was, somewhere around in there. But he was an old man and a good man. Everybody that knew him, Buster Montgomery, one of the best men we know, good neighbor, good fellow, good guy. But he realized he was lost. He realized 
at points in his life where he broke God's commandments and he knew the penalty for breaking God's commandments was everlasting torture in the lake of fire. He knew that was happening. And I went through the gospel with him, showed him the scriptures. We knelt there at his coffee table. He gave his life to the Lord. Man, I'm just, I'm just walking on cloud nine. And he said, now, next thing I know of, man's got to be baptized after that, doesn't he? And I'm going, yeah. He said, well, when are we going to get baptized? I said, well, how about a, a week from tomorrow? Tomorrow was Sunday, Sunday. I said, but how about a week from tomorrow? Let me get the baptistry cleaned up. He said, we'll be, we'll be there. Man got baptized. I tell you what, I've never seen, I've never had such a blessing like that. Somebody usually by that age, they've made up their mind how they're going to spend the rest of their life. They don't usually get saved at 77 years old. That's why the Bible tells us as young people, remember thy creator in the days of thy youth, the Bible says. That's why we bring our children at Bring your grandchildren to church so that they can hear the gospel at the youngest age possible to give them a chance in this world. Somebody say amen. All right. I ought to let you go now. But that wasn't the message. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. Let's tell you what let's do. Let's stand as we read this. Let's give reverence to God's word. In the days of... Um, Ezra, Ezra stood behind a pulpit of wood and he opened up the book and the people stood while Ezra read the word of God. We're going to read these first three verses. And God spake all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Let's read that out loud. All of us together. Verse three. Thou shalt not have no other gods before me. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. I pray, Lord, that you would help me to preach. Help me to preach, Father, without apology to any man. Help me to preach, Father, as if it was the last message I'd ever get to preach. I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would bless those who hear. I pray, Lord, that you would use it for your glory, your kingdom's sake. Lord, let it not be me that speaks, but let it be your Holy Spirit that speaks. I pray that you'd bless it this morning. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. You're, dis uh, uh, you're, don't, you're not dismissed. Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. Sit down. I ain't that big a hurry. I ain't that big a hurry to leave. I don't know, I don't know where we're going to stop tonight. So it doesn't matter to me how, how far I get today. I may piddle around, we drive an hour down the road and stop and go to bed. Who knows? I don't know. Now, that lady that I was talking to you about last week, she wrote a book called Who is God? And I told you about some of the things that she said. I, I mentioned some of the things she talked about uh, this last week during Pastor Mike Online, and I read some things out of her book that let you know that she has another God that the Bible does, the Bible does not describe the God that she believes in. The Bible describes for us an entirely different God. And I'm not going to get into all what, else, what all she said, what all she talked about that. I don't have time for that. But... She gave me a copy of her book and she put a bookmark in there, one that she had made up for her particular little water, whatever organization she belonged to. And she stuck that in there and I, um, I made a, a scan of the book and I've still got that particular chapter that she had. And I can tell, and boy, she is just way, 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 way off. And it wasn't until I came back and actually looked at the bookmarker that she gave me when I realized who her God was. Now, who remembers the Michelangelo painting in the top of the Sistine Chapel where we have Adam and he's just been created and he's got his finger out to, to touch God. God is floating in a cloud and he's got his finger out 
ready to touch Adam to give him life. Who's ever seen that painting before? Here is what is on her bookmark. Now, in case you can't see who her God is, let me zoom that in for you. Who is that? That's the dragon. The dragon. Remember last week, in, the, in this message, last week, I showed you Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, 2 Thess Thess Thessalonians chapter 2, where the man of sin said, I, I am God, I sit in the seat of God. Ezekiel 28, Lucifer himself says, I am God, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. Isaiah 14, Lucifer saying that I will be like the Most High. I will be like God. People will worship me, but think that they are worshiping God. That's who her God is. She has picked a different God to be her God. What I'm here to tell you this morning is that if you're not careful... You will carve out and you will choose a God that does not match the God of this Bible. I believe that this Bible contains the very Word of God. I believe that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I believe that God's words came down from heaven... To these men, those men faithfully committed those words to paper. Those papers were faithfully transmitted and preserved throughout the 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years that they had been writing. Some 40 men over the, over the course of 4,000 years, all writing from different perspectives, different times, and yet, all of them are writing about the exact same God, and there is not one single... I got all kinds of stuff in my Bible from that meeting. Boy, I wish I'd have seen that earlier. The guy next to us, if you saw the video, that was had people laying on his table, and he was waving his hands over them, he calls himself the Arcturian Blu-ray Healer. And he has, you probably can't see this, but he has on his hand, they showed it, he's got a mark on the inside of his palm that looks like a big gray alien head. That's who I rubbed shoulders with last two weeks ago. So I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you who the real God is. Somebody say amen. Let me read these verses again to you. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Exodus 18, 11. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. Somebody say amen. For in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. Uh, Psalm 82, 1. I know I read these verses last week. I'm going to read them again. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. In other words, there is not another God above our God. Our God is called the Most High God for a reason. That there's nothing above Him. There isn't... An, I had a guy tell me that there was a God who created our God... Who created, who created another God called Allah for the Muslims, who created another God uh, for, the, uh, for the Buddhists, who created another God for all the, uh, the Hindus, and another God for all these other people left in the world, that there was one God above this that nobody knew who it was. I'm telling you, I know that God. I know His name is Jehovah. He's the Most High God, and His Son's name is Jesus Christ. Somebody say Amen. Psalm 86, 8, that among the gods there is none like unto thee, O Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. Psalm 95, 3, for the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Psalm 96, 4, for the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Psalm 136, 2, O give thanks unto the God of gods, the Bible calls him. The God of all gods. 
There is no other angel. There is no other God in the heavens, in the universe, that is better, that is greater, that is higher, that is more faithful, that is more loving, that is more merciful, that is more forgiving than our God. Somebody say amen. Oh, give thanks unto the God of gods, for his mercy endureth forever. How long does God's mercy endure? So that sin that you committed 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that terrible thing that you did, that to this day you have a hard time even forgiving yourself of what you've done. I'm here to tell you that when God forgave you 20 years ago, He's still forgiving you to this day for the same sin. His mercy endureth forever. Psalm 138, 1, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I'll stand in the... I don't care if God... If the devil fills this whole church with a bunch of devils, I'm going to stand in the midst of them and I'm going to give praise to Jesus. Somebody say amen. Amen. Now, uh, let me move through this, some of this. Ah, Deuteronomy 18. Turn there. Deuteronomy 18. This is how serious God is. What is the what is the penalty for breaking the first commandment? What's the penalty? Death. Death. As by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin is what the Bible says. The book of James says if a man offends the law on one point, he is guilty of all. So if the the penalty if the penalty for breaking the very first law is death. The penalty for breaking any of the other laws, likewise, is death. Number one, it's death to this flesh. And there is no hope for this flesh. We do not teach, we do not believe that this flesh has any hope for it whatsoever. You're going to die you're going to end up in a casket somewhere or dumped in a hole somewhere or left out in the woods somewhere. You're going to die and there's no way around it. The death that you don't have to worry about is the death of the flesh. The death that you have to worry about is the death of the soul. Because the soul is eternal, so then is the death of the soul. Because death to the soul of the man is an everlasting, tormentous death. It is a conscious knowing that you are in the lake of fire that burneth with brimstone for eternity. And Jesus used the word everlasting punishment. He used that phrase. Everlasting torture. The rich man said, I am tormented in this flame. And by the way, that was 2,000 years ago. He has been in that flame now 2,000 years. Is he still tormented? Has he had relief? No. I had a talk one time with the guy I went to high school with. He grew up Catholic. 
And I had a, used to have a pen on my letter jacket, said Jesus saves or something like that. And he looked at me laughing. And he said, what is Jesus saved from? I said, he saves us from going to hell. He said, my priest told me that was the story they invented to scare little kids. What a shame. What a shame. Deuteronomy 18.20, But the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. God imposed the death penalty on any prophet of the people of Israel in the wilderness. God imposed the death penalty on anybody who said, I'm a prophet. And if they mention the name of any other God, God said the penalty upon them was the death penalty. God was serious about this issue. Now, I want you to turn and look, at, look with me at Deuteronomy 29. God gave me this this morning concerning this verse. I wasn't sure how I was going to preach this until just a little while ago. Deuteronomy 29. Deuteronomy 29, verse 18. Lest there, be, lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe. Isn't it, isn't it something how whole families seem to be of a certain religious persuasion? Whole families will be that way. If grandma and grandpa were Catholic, then... Practically everybody else in the family is going to be Catholic, even though they only go once a year Catholic, they're still Catholic. Or if grandma and grandpa had their membership down at First Baptist Church down in Sykeston, Missouri, they had that down there for 40 years, 50 years ago, then even all those grandkids, all my grandparents, they're members down at, down at First Baptist down here, and I guess we are too, but they've never been. So he said, lest there should be among you a man or a woman or a family or a tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations. Now watch this. Lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. What is it about gall and wormwood that stands out to you. What do those two things mean to you? Huh? Bitterness. Thank you, Brother George. Now here's what I want to say. And I want to say this. First of all, to myself. And then I want to say it to my wife. And I want to say it to my children. I want to say it to any of my grandchildren listening. Then I'm going to say it to anybody else, the rest of you, and everybody else online. Be careful about being bitter against God. Be careful. I've been angry at God. I've been upset with God. There are times when I have not understood God. Understood why He did what He did. When He did what He did. Why He took somebody that I loved. Why he made me go through something I didn't want to go through. I 
I've been angry at God. Even in that anger, I would go to God. It's, it's sort of like the verse that says, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Now, I know the reason behind that. Wives are easy to be bitter at. Don't none of you men say amen. I've been mad at my wife before. She's been mad at me. I'd have times where I'd be mad at my wife and I'd go crawl off and I'd, I'd say, God, I, I'm mad at my wife. I'm bitter. You told me not to be. I can't always control my feelings. So, God, I know, I know what can happen. If a man builds up bitterness against his wife, what can happen? If a man builds up bitterness against his wife, what, 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 what's, what's, what can happen after that? He starts looking for another one, doesn't he? Thinking... Oh, I bet that woman wouldn't do me that way. And God teaches us men to guard our hearts. He tells us as the church, or as, as, as men, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, do you think Christ would ever have a reason to be bitter against this church. Oh yeah. Have we not done enough to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to make him royally angry at us? And yet, does he not still love us? So... The same way that I've dealt with bitterness against my wife is the same way I've dealt with bitterness against God. Is that I'll just go to God, talk it out. God, I'm angry. God, I'm bitter. God, I don't like what you did. I don't understand what you did. I don't know why you did what you did. And God, I don't want to be angry at you. Because if I get angry at you and bitter at you, there's always a root in us of bitterness. Look at that look at that Bible. Lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. You can get mad at God and that root start growing up in you and the fruit that it produces is that one at some point then you will change God's. You'll change God's. The lady that I used to work for at a t-shirt shop, obviously she got bitter or something went wrong as a Southern Baptist Sunday School teacher and she jumped over to be a Jehovah's Witness. A man that I heard of was in a King James Bible church for years, flipped over, became a Catholic lay priest. It is possible 
that any one of us having a root that beareth gall and wormwood that can rise up in us and cause us bitterness against God for whatever reason. And we not only stay bitter and angry at God, we end up hating God. And then we will change our God. And the only other God to change to is the God of this world. Um, I've still got a lot here to preach, but I want to get to something important. By the way, all of those saints that they told you to, pre to pray to, Joe, when you were in the Catholic Church, those are gods. You, what you're doing is that you're putting another God before you and the real God. Oh, St. Joseph, please hear my prayer. St. Mary, please take my prayer to your son, blessed son, Jesus Christ. That's blasphemy. You are putting another God between you and God the Father. Now, let me tell you how smart God is. God knew that there had to be a mediator between us men and Him, God. So who did He choose as the mediator? The one who was God-man, Jesus Christ. He's still God, amen. So when you pray to God through Jesus Christ, you're not putting another God before you and God. He's still God. Amen. That's a bunch of nonsense anyway. And then the 330 million gods of Hindu. How in the world do you repent to 330 million gods? I'll never figure that out. By the way, do not get involved in yoga. Period. Do not get involved in yoga in no way, shape, or form. It is putting you in contact in yoke. That's what the word yoga means. It is yoking you with other gods. And God said, don't do it. Now, let me get to the most dangerous of all gods. Genesis 3. And then I'm going to let you go. Turn to Genesis 3. The greatest lie ever told by Satan when he was enticing Eve to eat the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. It was this lie. The serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. He is directly contradicting God's word. Because God said, Ye shall surely die. Satan said, Ye shall not surely die. Direct contradiction. Getting you to think that maybe God or his word is wrong. Which goes back to the root of bitterness that you can get in you when you start to think that God did you wrong. I'm here to tell you he's never done you wrong. Never. The serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The most 
dangerous of all gods is you. You're the most dangerous. Following your will Not waiting on God to answer your prayer so you jump ahead of Him to try to do it for Him. That will get you into a lot of trouble. I've done it. And God, I, can't, I cannot tell you how, how God revealed to me how stupid I was for trying to fulfill what I thought was God's plan, God proving to me that I should have just stayed out of it. I've made that mistake more than once. But putting yourself in the place of God is having another God before God. Where you say to yourself, I will do what pleases me. I will, I, and, and this is where that root of bitterness comes in. You're angry at God, you're mad at God, so you will say, God, I'll show you. I'll do everything that you said not to do. I will go against your will. And you can't stop me. I will turn my back on you. I will harden my heart against you. I will not have you in my thoughts. I will not pray a prayer to you. I will not ask you for anything. And there could be people sitting in church today who have turned in to their own God. Hating God all along. Warring against God. Here's what I'm going to say to you. If God loves you like he loves me. And I'm going to be honest with you. I have no idea why God loves me the way he does. But there was a time in my young, stupid life when I said to myself, Mike, you are the only one who can make you happy. So I had sort of determined that I was going to do what I wanted to do. And I was putting myself ahead of God. And God had to kill that God. God had to kill that God. Or I would not be here today. With every head bowed and every eye closed. No one's looking around. The camera's going to be on me. You can do this if you want to. You don't have to. I'd like to pray for you because I know what it feels like. If you are in a place where you are angry at God about something bitter, Bitter against God. Would you just slip your hand up right back down and I'll pray for you. The 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I, I believe that there are those who needed to hear what was said today. Maybe they did. Maybe someone online who has a root of bitterness against God. They have questions that they don't have answered. They have hurt and anger. And they don't know what to do about it. Father, I've been there. I know what it's like. And Father, I sure... I sure enjoy loving you more than I do being mad at you. One of these days, when I'm in heaven with you, I will understand why you did what you did. Right now, I don't. But I'm, I'm trying hard to trust you. And Lord, there may come in this world worse things that surely I would probably be very upset with you. But Father, I do. I, I, I enjoy loving you more than I do being bitter against you. So Father, help me to understand. Or help me to wait until the next life where I can finally understand why you did what you did. Father, I pray this prayer for my family for my church, for my friends, my brothers and sisters, for all of those that are online. I pray, dear God, that you would help anybody today that is hurt, bitter, angry. And before that anger and that bitterness turns to where they are ready to change gods. God, that you would just give a sweet spirit in them and teach them, Father, that it's far better to love you and to trust you than it is to be angry at you. Teach us how to put you first in everything in our lives. And to learn that it, we can trust you. We can put our lives in your hands. You are good to your people. You're better to us than we ever deserve. Just Father, give us that faith and that trust and take away that bitterness. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And all of God's people said... Amen. Are you glad you came to God's house this morning?